Good morning and uh, welcome to the program Perspectives. This morning we're looking at um, the Northern Governors Forum. Yes, the governors. In a democratic setting, the governors are turning out to be emperors. And um, you've just been wondering why I'm uh, picking on that today. But um, just look at the setup, you know, that we have. We, we have, um, we have uh, federal, state and um, local government. But from all indications, uh, this, the federal has given, you know, enough, you know, of its powers to what the states can do. And uh, so uh, states control their institutions. And uh, the question being asked is, uh, do the states have powers to do this, you know, not allowing autonomy for institutions of the state? Now, at the federal government level, we also see a situation where uh, the government has allowed for some of its institutions to be autonomous. Go to the National Assembly, you find the autonomy of the Assembly, financial and all of that. Go to the federal judiciary, you don't also find the autonomy uh, at the federal level. You also go to INEC, Independent National Electoral Commission. There is autonomy, so to say, uh, for these institutions to function properly and accordingly. But come to the states and see what is happening. Uh, from all indications, with the, uh, you know, President Muhammad Bari granting autonomy to, uh, to, to, to state level, financial autonomy at the local government levels. We have not seen this in operation too. What we're seeing is this strangled hold on um, autonomy of these institutions to function well. I also look at the State Independent Electoral Commission. I also look at the, you know, um, the National, uh, the State Assembly too. <laughs> you find out that uh, they're all, you know, in control or being controlled by the executive of, of the state. So we're looking at that. Why is that so? And of course, the Constitution provides too that uh, these institutions can be autonomous. We'll look at that. Uh, but again, looking at me with me, with, looking at it with me this morning and sharing his thoughts about why we are having this situation. I have um, uh, Yusuf Goje. Uh, Yusuf Goje is a public affairs analyst, and uh, together we'll just look at about, uh, look at why you know governors are opposed to you know autonomy of state institutions. Yusuf uh, Goje, good morning and glad to have you on the show. Good morning, sir. Uh, glad to be with you, sir. Yes. I, I just gave a background there about uh, what we're seeing um, at the state level. Uh, we, we, we see the three tiers of, you know, uh, the three tiers of government, federal, state, and uh, local. We also talked, we're also looking at the autonomy for this for state institutions to function well, where we're having federal institutions uh, doing well with, um, uh, you know, enough autonomy, but why we're not having these in the states? Um, just give us, you know, a general overview of your thoughts here. Uh, uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, Mr. Nash. Uh, I think um, this is a very germane issue uh, because it speaks to the survival of our democracy as a system. Uh, because democracy yes, is about the people, but we must also understand that what sustains democracy is where you have strong institutions. And you cannot have strong institutions when um, constitutionally backed um, powers that are given to them are hijacked, or you don't have the requisite uh, financial autonomy to be independent in taking decisions that will deepen our uh, democracy. So I, I just tells us that, yes, uh, we are in a civilian um, civil dispensation, but uh, the leadership mentality that we have carried over uh, is that of uh, the military mentality, where anybody that gets to power only thinks of uh, aggregating power and uh, not uh, decentralizing it. So yes, uh, on paper, uh, yes, we have a structure that operates a federal system, but if you look at the mindset of people that drive these uh, institutions or structures, they still have the military mentality where uh, they believe that all powers should be aggregated to them. And that is what we are seeing, uh, particularly now, making reference to state governors, uh, where uh, they get to power, and because uh, they have that latitude to 
manipulate the constitution, uh, they tend to hijack even powers that are meant for either uh, the lowest uh, government or other arms of government. In this case, we are talking about the local government and also the state judiciary and state houses uh, of assembly. And uh, the truth we must tell ourselves is that this is going to continue until we demonetize our politics and we remove the commercialization of our governance. Because a lot of the people that aspire to leadership are largely uh, power mongers or uh, largely political entrepreneurs and capitalists who believe that during elections they invest money and when they win elections they reap their profit. And that is how they see governance. And all of us as uh, mandate givers, as electorate, we are only pawns in their hands. We need to an end. So when uh, a lot of them get to power, they are not tolerant because uh, it is one thing to be a civilian leader and it is another thing to be a democrat. A lot of them are not democrats. So they end up accumulating all power that uh, even extends outside their constitutional uh, mandate in order to ensure that they control the resources in the state and their decision is final on all issues. They even uh, ensure that people that get to run these other institutions, like the judiciary, like the state legislative arm, are people that they have picked and people that would be totally loyal to them that we are, and are usually people that would not question uh, whatever directive they give. So uh, that is a real challenge for our democracy because uh, our constitution, which is the ground norm of uh, everything we do as a people, uh, stipulates the power and authority and the level of independence of these institutions not for anything, to ensure that there is separation of power and there is checks and balance. Because even the framers of uh, the, this constitution or any other constitution understands that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And when people are power drunk, then they, they tend to uh, become more dictatorial, even if uh, they get to that of is to a democratic or civilian process. So uh, that is why we provided for these institutions to ensure that they check the powers of whoever is the executive. So that again, uh, in Nigeria, we are really good at making laws, making policies, and making plans and programs, but we are very bad in implementing them. So we see a situation where the constitution is flouted uh, with impunity and even with arrogance. And there is no punitive measure uh, to see that uh, these people are in check. Sometimes you wonder whether we are under the rule of law or we are under the rule of the allies. Uh, because if you see how our constitution is being applied or executed, it is usually selective in terms of uh, how it favors the people that have the power to use the constitution. So these are issues that really should be of great concern to all of us because uh, the dysfunctionality in Nigeria now politically, economically, socially, uh, once you dig deep, you find out that they have the roots in the inability of these institutions to be able to be independent because if, for example, we have an independent legislative house of assembly, then it means that when the state governors spend their budget, they would look at the budget, they would see whether the budget reflects the aspiration of the state or, and also does it reflect the needs of the people they represent. If it does, yes, they pass it. If it doesn't, they question it and also hold the governor, the executive accountable in terms of changing it to reflect uh, what the people want. Then at the level of implementation, uh, you see that they do oversight in terms of how uh, is the executive in utilizing these funds that the legislators have approved through appropriation for them to use. At 
anything to the qualitative manner is just that for money, is it meeting the needs of the citizens as it were? Uh, and so uh, then it goes down even to auditing what the, the executive is doing. Uh, yes, you have spent money, but how uh, has spending that money impacted the lives of people? Uh, has it been their value for money? Has it delivered on what was promised or committed to do to be done? If we if done yet, yeah, if not done, then there would be other queries, there would be recommendations for punishment and what have you. So that we are yet to see that kind of legislative uh, functionality because a lot of them have been. I don't want to use the word objected because I don't have evidence, but a lot of them have uh, really been, uh, probably I used and slaves. Because if you look at it from Inisha, uh, who becomes the speaker, uh, who becomes the majority leader, who becomes the chief, is determined by the governor. And there are instances where you see that a whole legislature is made to be answerable to an appointee of a governor where he dictates on behalf of the governor how the legislative arm should function. So in a situation like that, you find out that you, you, you have an exclusive government where decisions are only solely taken to benefit the few within the, who are lawyers. Because there's nobody to check how he utilizes the power that the constitution has given to how he utilizes the resources, huge resources uh, being allocated to them. And we have seen situations where uh, state uh, assemblies are used by governors to provide uh, life pension and other allowances to state governors who are about to leave office. And a lot of them are reaping billions out of their state, while some of them even collect double uh, remuneration because some of them who want to become ministers and senators and what have you, to the detriment of the state. Billions of naira will be spent on governors that are not even serving the state at present, and not to talk of even the ones that we will speak. So these are uh, some of the issues that uh, we need to really quickly look at for. Uh, the president recently took a number of steps. Uh, one is, for example, in 2018, if you recall, uh, uh, about the number of bills that he or so was signed uh, by the president. The bills were sent to the president. He signed about four or five. And one of those bills is the autonomy, financial autonomy for the uh, state houses of the assembly, which is the legislature and the judiciary. You know that one year after the president signing that law, uh, you had about just, I think, uh, nine states or so that placed their legislative hands and judiciary on first line charge. First line charge means that once the budget is made, the allocations to the judiciary, to the legislatures, will be given to them 100%. So the executives do not have control over this fund. This is under the assumption that once they have all those funds, they don't have to run begging with the executives for monies to operate and what have you. But it benefits this company. And also, a year after that, the president also signed executive for that time. Uh, and again, the same governor still uh, refused to follow that executive order, even though the executive order is just a signed uh, order by the president, which necessarily does not carry much weight when you put it side by side with the constitution, or when you put it uh, when it is subjected to the legislative review. Probably the, the legislative can come up with bills that will counter that order. So, and you find out that at that point, the governors now quickly took the issue to the Supreme Court. Because what the executive order sought to achieve, uh, is seeking to achieve, uh, since it's still in existence, is that uh, once money comes to the from the federation account, what is due to the legislature and the uh, judiciary should be forwarded to them directly. 
Okay, uh, Yusuf, um, in all of these too, um, just something in opinion here, it's been said that um, the president of Nigeria could be seen maybe as um, a very, very powerful president of the world because of, you know, um, the powers, you know, um, provided under the constitution and out of the con constitution that he wields and, and so seen as a very powerful president. And then you come down to, you know, the second tier where you have the states they are also, ex, you know, expressing, you know, that their powers. And, and so, when you begin to look at this, the third tier of government and how it has been muzzled out or strangled, so to say, by, by the, you know, the executive in the state, could this just be about what we have at the federal level, where the executive too is muzzling down and um, strangling, uh, so to say, the, you know, the the, the the legislative arm of government? Because again, going by what we're seeing now, if you recall this, uh, this um, ninth assembly that we have it has expressly you know showed that uh, it wants to work with um, the executive and so whatever comes from the executive they're just ready to do the beatings of um, what comes from the executive and so it goes down to the state now at the local government level we, we, we hardly can see any tangible you know work being done by the local government all under this strangulation that we're, we're getting now the question now is is it about uh, the constitution has you know really said its own defended that there's autonomy and all of that but what just what can be done you know to to to, to make the local government third tier of government you know have a breath of air so to say to perform its functions yes uh, you know uh, i think we're living in 2018 or so when the uh, bills were sent to the president for action one of the bills that was sent was that of local government autonomy which I would blame the president for not signing it into law. Uh, I think there was a trade deal that that uh, where he gave us autonomy for the study and the legislature, and he uh, did not sign that of the local government autonomy. And that is why, you know, now it is also very difficult for uh, a lot of local government people carry out their responsibility effectively. And um, just recently, I don't know how true it is, I also I read somewhere that the president had also, also ordered all three governors to, um, to sack a Jessica committee or interim management committee. Uh, but you see, all that would not stand as long as we don't have the local government economy fully in place. Uh, because we have seen the National, the National Financial Intelligence Unit uh, Act, which also came into play to say that funds will be directly given to the local governments without the case we not have power to touch it. Uh, and even at that, we have seen that that process has been bypassed by the governor. Because even though the money goes directly to the local governments from the state joint account, they still call them uh, to uh, either the Ministry of the local government or uh, to the various government house. And that is where the money, to, how the money will be utilized, will be determined. And, you know, because the Constitution also gives the State House of Assembly power to provide for the structure and system of how local government will operate, when you look at most local government laws, there are statutory deductions and remittances that local governments must make immediately they receive their uh, allocations from the federal, from the staff. So it shows you that uh, one, yes, we need the laws, which is very important. We need also the acts and what have you. But again, we need also citizens to really wake up and begin to demand that those we elected, those who are to an oath, to, to uphold the Nigerian constitution, do that. Because we cannot continue to make laws, amend laws, and at the end of the day, our leaders don't do access to this law. And that is why you also see that even the followers are learning how to break laws, because they see their leaders breaking laws. So it is important that everybody plays his own part, because we can't say the president alone, uh, because even if you look at it at the federal level, as you have cited, uh, the judiciary to, uh, to a large extent is, uh, has financial autonomy 
هستی نش نه هستنگلی هستن هستی هستنگلی اینه هستن هستی هستنگلی یا دیپنگ در دیگه رو اپوینت لیدرشیپ از دیس پسکولار اینستیتوشن دی اولی تایم ریسورس تمپلانس از اندیپنگن where the legislative arm um, at the national level could question the, the, the president was during the last dispensation under Senator the Senator of the And uh, the, after then, we saw the interest that the federal government showed in ensuring that it was the yes man that was elected as the Senate president. Uh, and this thing did not start with this government. Even during a passenger, you recall the number of times that we have been impeached on a president because they did not dance to the tune of the president. So it means that there is something fundamentally wrong with uh, our democratization process. Not just for us to think that we have democracy, but do we, do we really have democrats running this country? So and that is what we are seeing being reflected as both the federal state. Uh, level because at the local government level, uh, a lot of them are just more of glorified government agents. No longer uh, the car government, uh, government because all their directives they can't cut without getting the approval of the executive government. And there are laws and laws and laws and acts that empower them. But these laws have been rendered uh, impotent. terms of actually giving them the power and authority to carry out their mandate which should have been which is give which should start the people of this local government and a lot of the challenges we face in this country is because of the over centralization of power when you have a population that is growing above 200 uh, we are 200,000 now But 2015, the day will be about 400 or so, over 400 uh, million, so at that time. Uh, it means that if you don't decentralize power for more people to participate in this system, then it means that uh, you continue to have a dysfunctional system because while population growth is increasing, you find out that economic growth is not because institutions that should ensure that The uh, governors, for example, have, uh, are able to work with their economy. But I see no reason why every time uh, there's a challenge at the federal level economically, the state government should be crying. State governments, there are state governors that depend solely on federal allocation. They can't even generate enough revenue in their state. So that will tell you that if they can't generate revenue in their state, it means that they are not growing their economy. state economy, because once you, you are growing uh, your state economy, it means that the revenue for you as government would increase. So it means that most of the governors that uh, we have, when it comes to the economies of their state, not the national economy as Nigeria and our economy, because all states are blessed with agricultural arable lands, agriculture, and other uh, investment opportunities. And most state governors don't take advantage of this. They just come in from the federal level and nothing really is being delivered uh, in terms of developing the economy uh, at the state level. So in Canada, with a functional uh, uh, legislative arm, you find out that if they are doing what they are supposed to do, they will be putting the governors to task to say, yes, what are you doing in terms of growing our economy at the state? What opportunities are you bringing in to ensure that the state is able to generate enough investment that will give the state enough revenue that what we are collecting from the Federal Accounts Allocation Committee will just be added advantage or added bonus. But we are not seeing governors thinking after the work because there's nobody to check them. There's nobody to question them. There's nobody to hold them accountable. And with the speakers of state houses of assembly, I just, uh, I don't want to use a deliberate word, but I just more, uh, let me not use the word, they are just uh, the, the back and call of the governors, which at any point in time, they can't question the government. We have also the judiciary, the same thing. We have also the local government, where 20% uh, of our federal uh, as well fund goes to local government. And this money comes on a monthly basis. And this money, you can't even track this money to know where this money is going to. Because at the end of the day, 
we find out that uh, the state sometimes even do employment on behalf of the local government. And while they do those employment, the local government can't even pay the salaries of their local government self because they don't have control. It is the directive from the usually the local government service commission that ends up determining the number of their staff. And what have you done? If you look at okay, uh, uh, I used to, I'll have to, you know, just uh, have a take a break now because um, we have to go for commercials. Uh, and so um, after the break, uh, I'll still call you in uh, as a program perspective this morning. And we're looking at uh, why governors are uh, opposed to autonomy of um, uh, state institutions. Uh, these are, you know, the, 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 what we're looking at this morning. And uh, Yusuf Goji, a public affairs analyst, sharing thoughts with us this morning. We'll go for commercial break. Break. Be back with you shortly. Welcome back. Is the program Perspectives this morning and uh, coming to you on Invicta 98.9. And, and we're looking at um, governance, you know, um, not giving um, state uh, institutions um, autonomy or to be autonomous enough to function, you know, properly. And of course, the third tier of government, that's the state local government too, uh, in spite of what the, you know, the laws have said, that yes, financial autonomy to the local government. And um, Yusuf Goje is doing, uh, sharing thoughts with us on that. Uh, uh, Yusuf, may I just, um, can you hear me? Okay, we're just going to get uh, Yusuf back on the line. But, you know, what I want to put across w would be on um, on the, you know, 2023 as it's drawing near. And, of course, it will be a time that Nigerians, again, would go to exercise their rights, you know, and this time, again, to vote. But uh, if we're having this um, muscling and uh, strangled hold on state institutions, um, what, again, are the prospects of having credible, free and free, credible elections, um, CECOM, state independent elections, you know, uh, commissions that we have. And of course, I'm um, talking about the judiciary in the state and of course, uh, looking at um, the state governments too, how how well these institutions can function for free, fair and credible elections. Uh, Yusuf, hello? Yes, I can hear you. Now. Yes, I, I was just bringing in, um, you know, getting ready for 2023 elections. And uh, more than any other time, what we are saying and what we all do want is to have uh, credible elections. But with this muslin and stranglehold that we're talking about, you know, governors having on um, uh, the state independent electoral commission, the, the state assemblies, um, the judiciary too, how well, again, can we talk about credible elections with this um, strangulations that we're seeing from governors on these in state institutions? Well, uh, I think uh, as long as the present system continues to uh, persist, our elections will continue to be the way they are. Because for one, uh, the cost of governance is high. And when we talk of even the cost of governance here, we are not talking about governance as it regards to the development that increases the socioeconomic development of all residents of either the state or the nation. The cost of governance in the sense that uh, the people that occupy these offices get so much privileges that ends up costing us money. Money, but it also takes away money that should be invested uh, into development to take it into private pockets, where uh, people that uh, in their community uh, we know uh, what their source of income is, what their level of standard of living uh, is. They immediately they get appointed or elected into any government office. We begin to see mansions creeping up. We begin to see different cars. We begin to see uh, people flying abroad for vacation and what have you. And largely, this is what uh, attracts a lot of people into politics and into wanting to hold uh, leadership positions in the country. So it means that uh, the fundamental issue is that we must uh, de commercialize government. Uh, by the time you take away all the allowances, 
that governors, for example, local governments generally enjoy, that commissioners enjoy, and you give them with the basic salaries and all that they have. And I assure you, a lot of them will not be what they are doing. So it means that uh, as long as uh, we don't address it, uh, this challenge will persist. And you know, that is why even you have scholars like uh, Plato who credit, who is largely against democracy. Because he always feels that when the population uh, are in inform or uh, are not happy, then you end, you end up only electing leaders that will continue to suppress them because they don't have understanding of the various choices before them. They are not uh, politically educated enough to take informed decisions uh, during elections. And even after elections, ensure that they hold these leaders accountable. Uh, and whether we like it or not, uh, we can't also take away this thing from we follow us uh, because uh, we know people that get into pregnant and become rich overnight but we end up worshipping them we end up giving them awards we end up giving them traditional titles just because uh, there's an exchange of Ghana Moscow or what has been and at the end of the day we are the ones perpetuating this kind of leadership that largely only thinks of accommodating more power so they use the resources of government, they use the institutions of government to amass wealth, to amass wealth, uh, uh, power to win elections. So it means that uh, they have, we well, they, they as citizens, the majority of us have sold our patrons, if I use that word, uh, for a few, uh, I will, in the majority of Nigerians don't even get up to Ghana Moscow. Some sell their votes for 30, for 1,000 naira, some for 500 naira, and all that. And yet, we can always use the excuse that they are hunger and what have you. But again, you don't sell your bad rights because of hunger. Uh, because even after you sold your bad rights, you still come back to still suffer the nemesis of you for the authority system that all stakeholders, it's not enough for us to educate really that we the followers we have our own people to work to play. Uh, democracy is government of the people by the people and for the people. And uh, the constitution has given us exclusive power to say sovereignty belongs to us, from whom the government uh, gets the right to power and authority. So without us, those in government do not have power, do not have authority. And it goes further to say that our participation in the government is guaranteed by the Constitution. So it means it is our right to question what the, our staff are doing, to question how these institutions, because yes, we even focus on the governors, for example. Can we look at what is our, our legislators do? Do we just elect people and we go to speak to the chambers and just uh, rubber stamp everything that is going to them? Or are we sending people that go to question everything that is brought before them to ensure that it benefits us who send them there to represent us? So these are the six very rules that we must begin to emphasize that institutions that will ensure that our democracy system must work and we cannot compromise it. But the moment we all we want to do when we see these people is to become professional persons that uh, begin to give them titles. Begin, they will continue to perpetuate them because everybody likes to be able to be attacked. And the person will continue to amass wealth because he feels that the only way for him to be to be attacked is for him to become uh, selectively general. Uh, I don't want to use the word mysteriously general. Yes, you, you, you are only recognized as a politician now, not by the qualities of leadership you have, not by the quality of the constitution you have and what have you. So these are issues that we must also really, really address. We cannot put the task for the cost. Because yes, <coughs> if you're hungry, uh, you, you can sacrifice hunger to ensure that we have an enabling environment that will make our economy work 
so that you yourself will be sure in the future. Your children will come and eat from it. But if we are going to do that now, we ourselves will suffer from it. Our children will come and suffer from it. And if the blame will be on us, not our leaders, because a lot of us sold our uh, our, our bad right to these leaders for peanuts. A lot of us have compromised where we are supposed to call our leaders to account. We refuse to call them to account because we don't care. Okay, um, Yusuf, just uh, let me bring in the audience now, uh, ask some few questions and make comments too. Uh, let's get to hear, you know, from their own side. And numbers to call to be part of this program, 81 40989 or 70 0708789 and we're looking at, um, you know, governors' um, uh, opposition to autonomy of state institutions. And um, uh, this, you know, may, you know, affect coming elections, too. And so let's get your thoughts here, too. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Good morning. How are you? Oh, good. I'm Luca, the opponent from Maravarido. Okay, Luca from Maravarido. Let's hear you. Yeah, the problem of... Uh... We are talking about the constitution itself. It is a military constitution. This constitution was not made the test of Nigerians. That is why most of the governors today have made themselves emperors within their own states. If you look at our National Assembly, specifically the Senate, it's a, a Senate of governors. If you come back to look at the, most of the governors, most of the governors are senators. Then some of the, the members of the House of Bay, everybody wants to be a senator. You see, I don't know if Nigeria did not rise against the constitution amendment for the constitution to be amended, to reduce the powers of this government. In fact, Trump continue until the kingdom come. At least, the constitution should be made to my own view that uh, once you have become a governor, the issue of being a senator should not even come in. And once you have become a senator, the issue of being a governor should not actually be out. At least that would reduce what we are facing right now. Because the governors today, like I've earlier said, they have become imperial. I mean, uh, uh, I mean how do I describe them? And even like the, uh, the adjective to even qualify them. Because the powers show that on them, in fact, is too much. Judiciary at the state level is being pocketed by the governors. Same thing, the, uh, the, the, the sake of whatever they call it. Then you talk about the House of Assembly, the House of Assembly, which of course is a judge. Uh, uh, I'm saying, in fact, I can't make some the, 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 the executive of, the, uh, of this. So I think uh, to the government of Nigeria against uh, the people who this group of people have placed themselves as a group so as a uh, to be amended. Okay, to okay. Nigeria. All right, Luca, we, we got you on that. Um, we'll still take more calls and then uh, i come back to our, our guest here. Uh, autonomy. Uh, you know, governors opposed to autonomy for, you know, state institutions and, of course, um, uh, the, the third tier of government, too, at the local level. And so as we get ready for, you know, 2023, how this, you know, could, you know, tell on uh, having free, fair, and credible Hello. elections. I'll take this call. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, sir. Yes, good morning. It's Francis Collins. All right, Francis, let's get it. Thank you. First, like the first caller have rightly said, we are going to get it right. At the time the so-called constitution is abolished and Nigerians come together and draft a new constitution. Because what we are using as a constitution is being applied when the elite wants to gain something from the country. But the masses have nothing to benefit from that so-called constitution. Prime the time they drafted it until now, the masses of this nation has nothing to benefit from that. And that is the reason why only the elites keep on controlling power, them and their relations and friends and children. 
for instance, like the first caller said, if we are going to draft constitution based on reality on ground today, <clears throat> I don't think that we will give that uh, separation from being a governor to senator, from senator to uh, vice president and the rest. Once you occupy office of the governor, you remain there. Once you finish, you are done. Once you contest for senate or you go to the senate, you cannot go to governor, you cannot go to president. So anyone that you know that you want to contribute to the development of Nigeria as a politician, you pursue that. You can't start from chairmanship of local government to house of reps, from house of reps to governor, while there are other Nigerians that are well educated and well wisdom to bring out the beauty of this nation. Okay. The people that have power keep on blocking them from doing the right thing. Okay. So until they abolish their constitution, so Nigeria will get it right. Okay, Francis, we got you. I'll, I'll just take one call and then, and then I come back to our guest here. Yeah, just one more call and then we'll get back to our guest. Um, people finding fault with the constitution and of course um, what we can do about it. Uh, hello, good morning. Hello, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Morning, sir. Good morning. Yes, yes sir. You're speaking from the uh, prince from Mr. I didn't get the name. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, the topic of discussion is uh, autonomous of the state. Oh, God. We're having. Yes, yes. Uh, so people have a question. Currently, I'm <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry. We are just not getting you. Uh, we're not getting you clear, you know, on, on this line. Uh, so you just may want to try again. We so can get you clearer. But I still can take one more call before I, you know, we get to our guest um, on the program today on zero eight one forty thousand nine eight nine or zero seven zero eight seven eight hundred nine eight nine. I'm squeezing this call. Hello. Good morning. Hello. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you? I'm good. I'm Abu from Nasarawa. Okay, Abu, Abu from Nasarawa. Let's hear you. I just want to send the two uh, callers. Yes. I think they bless them. I have the same opinion with them. Mm. If Nigeria should go back to constitution, follow the law, in fact, we will not have problems. Three that we are having problems. Nobody is carry carry the law seriously. That's why we are so far. Like uh, the head of it is serious. Let me tell you, me that I'm talking now, I just if it cough, just cough, not talk, not talk. I will keep fight. But if the law from the top is not working, everybody even suggest the way of falling in. I will spoil. It. Because nobody is serious. Thank you, sir. Okay, I will go on that. Uh, Yusuf, if I may come to you now. Uh, Luca, Francis, and Abu are uh, all hammering on the constitution that um, there has to be tinkering or, you know, redo the constitution if we have to, you know, for us to know the, where we, we're heading to. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have been listening to the call and I totally understand the frustration about the constitution. Um, but I must also add that uh, usually problems like this are more complicated than just changing the constitution. Uh, because you can change the constitution a hundred times, uh, but once the right people to make it work are not there, it still goes takes us back. People will still complain about the constitution. So yes, I agree with them. There are fundamental things that should be changed or uh, the constitution should be amended. But let's not think that immediately we change the constitution and solve our problem. That would be simplifying the problem we have. A major thing we need to focus on is attitudinal change, both at the level of the leadership and at the level of followership. Then if you give us any constitution, then it will work. Presently, I can assure you, for people that have taken time to, one, read the Constitution, read a lot of our acts, read a lot of our policies, read a lot of our plans and programs as a nation, you find out that a lot of them 
this one has just focused on implementing 60% of them as stated in those documents. Nigeria would have gone beyond where it is. So uh, we shouldn't uh, just say that uh, it is the constitution. Yes, the constitution needs to be changed, but beyond the constitution, let's look at the quality of people that would ensure that what is in the constitution is being implemented or executed. Once they are wrong, no matter if you carry the constitution of America and bring it to Nigeria now, it will still not serve the purpose because we have seen politics, reforms that have been brought from America, that have worked from in Europe and have been brought to Nigeria, but have failed in Nigeria. And it is not because it is the policy that has, or the reform that has issues, but the people implementing it is the issue. So we need to look at it from a holistic point of view so that we don't feel that there is a one fit all a solution to this problem, which is just think the constitution. The America has been running the constitution for uh, close to 400 years or so, and very few amendments. And it is because the people implementing it understand that we must abide by this constitution. And that is why, till now, even from this uh, last uh, controversial transition process, you saw how the American constitution stood supreme because institutions, and when we talk of institutions, institutions don't work for one by themselves. The human beings, like you and I, that make institutions work, that make institutions strong ensure that the constitution was supreme. So that is the kind of democratic culture that we need to begin to invite in Nigeria. And not just to say, you know, that it's just like the culture of creating committee. Every problem in Nigeria will create committee, I hope committee and all that. And the same thing, they come back, they worsen the problem even more. So we, I think we need to look at that issue very more broadly in ensuring that, yes, use the constitution to strengthen uh, some of these institutions, particularly at the state level because and the local government level, because that is the closest to the people. That is where the majority of Nigerians reside. Because if you remove the state in uh, Abuja, where is Nigeria? There is no Nigeria. So it is this state that make up uh, this Nigeria. Then secondly, he made an issue, uh, one of the scholars made an issue of uh, a leader coming from the local government chairman wants to become a uh, legislator legislat and a governor. It doesn't matter how long a person stays in the legislature or in the position of power. It is about the quality of leadership he provides. Look at the American Senate, for example. You see there are people that have spent 30 to 40 years as senators in America and they held lower legislative uh, positions in their various states before coming to the American Senate. But they have been there, and their people have been re-electing them over and over and over again. So it means that what we should be looking out for is also quality leadership. How can we ensure that we have quality leadership that at any point in time, if that person doesn't perform, we elect him out. If he performs, we can keep him for the next 100 years as long as is delivering the services we want. Because it is not about the religion of the person, it's not about the ethnicity of the person, it's not about the political party of the person, it is about the services that he is able to deliver that would remove people from poverty, that would create an enabling environment for people to get jobs and work, that would ensure that people will go to hospital and get the required quality of health care services, that will ensure that children will go to school and uh, all the infrastructure, all the furniture, all the instructional materials, the quality teachers that are available to teach our children. We have an economy that is growing and robust. Why do you have that kind of leadership? I can assure you, you wouldn't mind for that kind of leadership to be a 400 years. Okay. It's not about just for taking leadership, it's about the quality of service. All right, um, Yusuf Goje, I'd uh, like to thank you so very much for coming on the program this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Always my pleasure. Uh, okay, and that will just be about the size of it on Perspectives today. We're looking at um, why governors um, have um, opposed autonomy of state for state institutions and, of course, uh, the, local, the, local, the local government level too. Our guest has been Yusuf Goje, a public affairs analyst. We'll come back with Perspectives tomorrow. I'd like to thank, uh, please, for connecting me with the people this morning.
Good morning.